my name is Paige Dienaber, and this is my first YouTube video that doesn't involve radio or really disgusting hotel rooms. I'm actually in a hotel room right now. I'm in the Twin Cities. I'm flying to West Palm Beach tomorrow and will be um, carving a couple of hours out of my work schedule to go out and look at locations and, and places that were significant to the December 1st, 1979 disappearance of Mike Olson. Uh, Mike had graduated a year ahead for, of me from high school. Uh, I went to Edina East High School, and uh, when I graduated, I had moved out to California with my folks and was going to college, and I remember coming back from uh, Christmas break, freshman year in college, and this was back when people used to write letters to kind of update you about the news of the world, and there was a letter from somebody back uh, at home who had been in the course of updating me on the news of the world as it pertained to Edina, uh, included that Mike Olson had disappeared and down in Florida and there wasn't really anything else about it. And I had been pretty fortunate. I, except for my grandparents, I hadn't known anybody who had passed away and I certainly didn't know anybody who had ever disappeared. So it was really, I mean, just startling out of the blue to get that information. And when I got back to the Twin Cities that summer, it came up a few times, um, but nobody really knew anything. And there was, you know, there wasn't social media and there wasn't, you know, the internet, so there was easy to look for information. And 40 years passed. And several months ago, I was working with one of my clients, helping them research a podcast, and was at a thing called the Charlie Project, which is a, a repository or archive of information about people who have disappeared or are, mi are missing. And they have it broken down by states. And we were looking at Florida, and Michael John Olson just kind of popped off the page. And it was his story and what had happened. And that kind of led me to a Reddit page what was it was dedicated to, to Mike and his disappearance. And it filled in a lot of the pictures. A lot of people were speculating about what they thought had happened. His nieces were there, and they were kind of detailing the, the impact that it had had on the family and on the parents who had never obviously gotten over it. And, you know, after the police had run it as far as they could, they turned it over to private investigators and the family apparently still had a lot of the notes about it. And uh, what had happened was that Mike had taken off a year from the University of Minnesota and gone to Florida to get kind of a, a foot in the door in the golf industry. He had worked at a country club in the Twin Cities, but his goal was to work in the golf industry and what better place than, you know, South Florida. So he'd been there for just a couple weeks, he was still at a hotel, and one night went out with a co-worker, a guy who was his age, 20, uh, from the country club, President's Golf Club in West Palm Beach, and they went out for a night uh, at the dog track, and they went out to a couple clubs, and Mike dropped his co-worker off at his van at 5 a.m., and somewhere between that location and the hotel that he was staying at, he disappeared. A mile and a half, disappeared including his car, he had a brand new 1979 Grand Prix. So it was really interesting to read about this and kind of get more details about what had happened. And not that long after that, I was having uh, drinks and dinner with a bunch of friends from high school, and one of them had just recently retired from a suburban police department where he'd been chief of police. And his career highlight, and he admittedly tell you this, was that he had received a pretty significant award for closing a triple homicide arson cold case. And so we were talking about that and I brought up the Mike Olson case and I just said, you know, is there anything effective? I mean, do things like billboards and videos and things like that all these years later help? And I'm gonna, you know, butcher the paraphrase, but he said something to the effect of, uh, nothing bad will ever come from, you know, keeping a spotlight on these kinds of stories. So that's what I'm going to do. I leave in the morning, but right now, uh, here's, here's a little bit about Mike Olson. Michael John Olson was born on November 9th, 1959, and grew up in Edina, Minnesota. His parents were John and Sue. John worked as a receiving clerk at the Ford uh, Manufacturing Plant in St. Paul. He had an older sister and two younger brothers, and in one of the online articles regarding the case, one of his nieces said that when Mike disappeared, her father lost his best friend. You look at quotes and articles and comments about Mike, either from classmates or people he worked with. It was always great guy, great kid, awesome friend. Edina was where he grew up. It's an affluent suburb of Minneapolis, not a bad place to grow up. He grew up in the country club district. 
lots of tree-lined, oak-lined streets. There was a creek that runs through the community, and during the summer, that's where you went. You went to, to fish, to canoe. Uh, during the winter, you could skate on it. The city plowed it. Up the street from where Mike grew up was a uh, little main street called 50th in France. There was a drugstore there called Clancy's, and on the main level, they had a pharmacy, and in the basement, one of the greatest toy stores ever. Mike went to Wooddale Elementary School, then Southview Junior High, and finally Edina East High School, where he graduated in 1978. He was on the student council. He was on the golf team where he indulged his passion for golf. And during uh, the winter, he was a rink manager at one of the community skating rinks working for the park district. During the summer, Mike worked at the Edina Country Club as a bag boy, uh, a, a caddy. After graduating from high school, he did, like a lot of students from Edina, they, he went to the University of Minnesota, which, which is a large metro college, 50,000 students, on-campus housing, off-campus housing, and a lot of people just choose to live at home. And from Edina, you would take the 52B bus to get to school. So after a year of business courses in the fall of 1979, Mike decided to relocate to Florida and get some experience in the golf business. Before there was a president who owned a golf course in West Palm Beach, there was the President's Golf Club in West Palm Beach, and that's where Mike Olson moved in November of 1979, when his father uh, was quoted in the paper talking about would Mike have just walked away and, and, and moved somewhere else? He said no, that Mike was happy. He had work and he could golf at a place where that he had spent uh, with the help of some friends at the Edina Golf Course where he'd been a caddy master and assistant starter. He'd been spending six months trying to line up this job. He thought it was just inexplicable or improbable that Mike would just walk away from it. I'm at 2300 Presidential Way in West Palm Beach, Florida. This was home to the Presidential Country Club, Presidential Golf Course. I'm unclear whether Mike had the job lined up before he got down here, but he got a job right away. He was, again, an avid golfer, loved golf, uh, had worked at country clubs all the way through high school, member of the golf team, and wanted to get into the golfing business. So this was a great place for him to uh, get some experience down here. In fact, it was his co-workers, his supervisor, Richard Jensen, and then his partner for that evening, Jim, who had reached out to the police to alert them that he had not come into work and he had not come back to his hotel. They were concerned about him. Richard Jensen had actually reached out to Mike's old country club in the Twin Cities, the Atlanta Country Club, and asked his boss there, had Mike just gotten in his car and driven back. On the day of November 30th, he had gone to try to find a place to live. He was still looking for a rental property. He went to a rental agency uh, and had made a comment that if he didn't get a place pretty soon, he was going to probably move back to the Twin Cities. He'd also, in the days before his disappearance, made kind of a vague comment to somebody about having a 1,200-mile drive ahead of him. What that meant is unclear. But this is the site of the Presidential Country Club, the Presidential Golf Course, where he had worked. And uh, again, his coworkers were his friends and were genuinely concerned about him when he disappeared. It's a little bit windy. We're at the Palm Beach Kennel Club. This is kind of where the evening started for Mike Olson and his co-worker Jim from the Presidential Golf Club. Uh, they came out here for the beginning of a night. Uh, Palm Beach Kennel Club is still here as it probably was exactly the same in 1979. It's right across the street from the West Palm Beach Airport and what you find when you're down here looking at this case is that everything was pretty close to each other. They started the evening here in the police report. Uh, his friend Jim said that they stayed through the 12th race. I'm not sure what the 12th race was, but it was sometime pretty late in the evening. Uh, in the police report, Jim said that Mike had lost about $50. Uh, in the newspaper article about it later, he was quoted as saying that Mike had had a good night and that he was uh, wheeling trifectas and making multiple bets on uh, every race. We know that they were here until the 12th race, and then they headed off for uh, a very late evening, early morning of hitting nightclubs nearby. If you find this video informative and you want to get updated videos regarding this case and others regarding Minnesota's Missing, please hit subscribe below. On November 30th, 1979, in West Palm Beach, the high had been 70. It had been partly cloudy skies. And overnight, it was going to get down to the high 40s, which in South Florida, 
is kind of apocalyptic, but for a couple of guys from Minnesota and upstate New York, it was positively balmy. So following the 12th race at the Palm Beach Kennel Club, they decided to extend the evening and head to a place called the Wildside Lounge for the 2 a.m. telecast of a boxing match. Wildside Lounge may actually uh, have an ironic and appropriate name. I'm here on Okeechobee in uh, West Palm Beach. This is only about four minutes away from where uh, they left the Palm Beach Kennel Club. It's early in the morning on December 1st, 1979. Okeechobee has not changed that much in terms of roads. Behind me, this was the Wild Side Lounge, and this was their first stop in the evening. By the way, all the information I'm getting for this come from things like police reports, and I also archived a lot of newspaper articles the local papers down here did some reports on it. Uh, the Minneapolis paper had a reporter on it, and then the local paper, the Adina Sun, uh, they did updates every year, for at least for a couple of years, just to talk about the family search. So, the Wildside Lounge is now a Metro PCS, but back then it was a lounge where they went uh, probably around midnight, a little bit after, to watch a live boxing match. It should be noted that no matter how much Mike had won or lost, he had cashed a check for 700 bucks, which in 1979 is the value of $2,595. That's a chunk of money. Uh, they went to two different places where maybe people saw him with that money, and he showed up on people's radar. This is the first one. This is uh, the former Wild Side Lounge in West Palm Beach, Florida. And now the third and final stop of the evening before Mike uh, dropped off his friend at his van down at Cherry and Congress. This was uh, Mr. G's. It was a real popular dance spot back in the 70s. It's now a very popular dance spot too. Um, this would be one of the two places maybe that somebody had tagged him for having some money. He maybe accidentally showed his billfold or something like that. What that would require though, uh, maybe it was at the wild side, maybe it was here, it would still require that somebody would follow him from there, Mr. G's, up to Congress, all the way down, all the way being you know, three quarters of a mile, down to where the van was parked at the Baptist Church, and then follow him back up about eight minutes to his hotel. At five in the morning, there would be cars out, it would be difficult to to follow somebody, I would think, and not, not get spotted. But if this was one of the places where people would uh, decide to make him a target, this would be it. On the Reddit thread, there was some thought about, on the drive back from the church to the uh, hotel, that he had been carjacked at one of the intersections. Again, Okeechobee, even at 5 a.m. in 1979, doesn't seem like the kind of street that you could get away with doing it just because there's traffic. Uh, but it's possible. Or again, he was uh, robbed in his hotel parking lot and spirited away. But this is the final spot. Uh, they were here following, watching uh, boxing at the Wild Side. And then uh, ended up the evening at about 4.30 and he took his friend back to his car. We're here in the parking lot of the Belvedere Baptist Church, which is uh, where Mike was last seen at 5 a.m. on December 1st, 1979. Right across the road, you can kind of see, uh, that's the uh, kennel club in the background. People used to park their cars, and apparently still do park their cars here, when they've got, uh, oh, they want to save a few dollars on the parking fee at the racetrack. We know that um, Mike dropped off his coworker Jim here at 5 a.m., said that he would see him in the morning, and then was never seen again. So at 5 a.m., Mike Olson heads towards the Hojo's. Again, it's it's a pretty quick trip. It's seven or eight minutes. Sometime in the next few minutes after leaving the Baptist Church, whatever happened, happened. Did he get to the hotel and something happened when he got to his room? There doesn't appear to be any evidence that he ever returned to his room. So it happened either at the hotel or it happened on the route. The hotel... Um, I don't know where room 114 was, but if it was at the back of the hotel, the north side facing the canal, that would be kind of dark and secluded. It's right now for uh, El Dorado furniture, it's more or less an alley. And, you know, at 5 a.m., it would be dark. Sunrise was 6.50 a.m. on that morning. 
So that's very likely that's where it occurred. On the route, there was some speculation online that perhaps there was a road incident or there was uh, a carjacking or something. Heading north on Congress, there would be no real place for him to be carjacked or stopped. There's no stoplights. The first stoplight is at Okeechobee. He would have turned right there. There was one more light, and then he would have been at the Hojo's. Okeechobee's, you know, even at 5 a.m., is going to be a busy enough street that it just doesn't seem plausible that he could be stopped and somebody takes his car or takes him into another car and somebody then takes his car. It just, it seems to to brightly lit. And in terms of him stopping at a business along Congress or, again, something happening on Okeechobee, I'll cover it later, but the police did a very good job of going out and talking to business owners, people who would be up at 5 a.m. They talked to milk delivery men, a bread delivery man, clerks at businesses that would be working at 5 a.m., and they didn't see anything. So something happened. If it did happen not at the hotel, then it happened along Congress or Okeechobee. Congress would be, again, there's not a lot of lights, and you have a lot of businesses that are spread far apart, so there's not a natural lot of uh, business light or, or anything like that. It's kind of tree-shaded. It's kind of dark. Could it have happened there? I still don't think it's likely. I think it happened at the Hojo's. And if he made it back from uh, the Baptist Church, it was about three stoplights, it was about eight minutes, and this would have been uh, the final stop. This is the Howard Johnson's, or where the Howard Johnson's was in 1979. There's no actual photos on the internet of that Howard Johnson's. If you look for it, there was another West Palm Howard Johnson's, but it was over uh, near the intercoastal waterway. Uh, it was an L-shaped hotel, and it looked like at the, you know, the juncture in the L there would have been an office. And he was in room 114. Again, if he got back, this is where whatever occurred would have happened. Behind the hotel, there's a pond, and it's right next to the interstate. But this is it. The Howard Johnson's on Okeechobee, 1901 Okeechobee, in December of 1979, and possibly the place where the crime occurred. I'll cover that in just a little bit. Uh, the private investigator finally was able to talk to some people who stayed at the hotel. And now on to the next location. And now just to give some perspective, here's an aerial photo from 1979. Following this will be a photo from 2017. You'll see that uh, you know the, the landscape has not been changed. There have not been any big construction projects that removed canals or put canals in or did anything like that. You can see the inverted L of the Howard Johnson's, uh, the parking lot to the north, which has now kind of been cut in half or halved into an alley by the El Dorado complex. To the north, you have kind of a grassy, typical Florida field. When I was down there, it was populated with iguanas, which was actually kind of cool. Looking at it, you can see where the office is, which is at the juncture of where the two buildings are. It's set back from the parking lot enough that the office probably could not see anything out their windows. And again, I'm assuming that they had, you know, Florida ceiling windows, which most hotels do in the lobby. But with the two buildings kind of cutting off the view from the west side of the north parking lot and the south side of the east parking lot, there are literally no photos of this hotel that exist. I've gone to a West Palm Beach group. I've gone to a couple of them, and just nobody has photos. So unless they're in somebody's travel packet of photos from when they went to see Grandma in 1973 or something, there's just no photos except for these. To the north, you'll see some homes from Ware Circle. Those homes are still there. Let's look at 2017. Now, what you can see here is a much better or clearer view is the off-ramp for Highway 95. It would have a pretty good view in 1979 of a Howard Johnson's parking lot. It would be right there. It's less than 500 feet from the road. The challenge is, is that this occurred on a Saturday morning. Saturday mornings at 5 a.m. are a pretty irregular traffic pattern. If it had happened during the week, somebody from the off-ramp, somebody on Highway 95, which is just a little bit out of view on the, on the right, could have seen it. Because if you're traveling or commuting at 5 a.m., that is probably a very regular schedule that you keep. And I'm sure that law enforcement would have then tried to somehow message people who commute at that hour to ask if they'd looked out and seen anything. But they didn't. I'm outside the West Palm Beach Police Department. I'm not sure if this is the location that it was in in 1979. What we know from the records was that uh, 
Mike disappeared on the morning of December 1st. Uh, the people from the golf course tried to reach him later in the day. On December 2nd, they actually went to the uh, hotel where he was staying, the Howard Johnson's, and with the help of the uh, desk clerk and the manager, were able to access his room where all of his stuff was. On the 2nd, he also missed a scheduled phone call with his brother up in Minnesota, and it appears that the first contact with the police department was on the morning of December 3rd, and it was coming from, again, the people from the golf course's manager, Richard Jensen, and then his friend, uh, Jim, and that quickly initiated what I think in, in the terms of law enforcement, they could say uh, the balloon went up. On the afternoon of December 2nd, Sunday, uh, Mike's co-workers, having not heard anything from him, went back to the Howard Johnson's, looked for his car, knocked on the door, didn't get a response, so they went to the hotel manager who opened his room and found his clothes and his golf clubs. Uh, returned to the office and called the police and filed a Bill Skipper report. It seems like they had a lot of uh, guests who skipped on bills at that hotel, so this might not have been something new for them. On the morning of December 3rd, Sergeant Richard Engelhart started work at the West Palm Beach Police Department, got the report, and opened a file called N-75189. In the meantime, Mike's co-workers called the United Country Club and spoke to his former boss, his supervisor there, to see if he had heard anything from Mike. And uh, he said that he had not. He then called Sue Olson, Mike's mother, and said that something was going on in Florida. She called the West Palm Beach Police Department, and by then, uh, Engelhardt had already contacted Mike's co-workers, uh, Jim Cronin, Rich Jensen, and begun looking into what had happened the previous day. Sue Olson called her husband, John, at his work, and told him that their son was missing. His response in a later interview was, when my wife called me at work and said he was missing, I got a sick feeling inside of me. I knew something was wrong. I said, what do you mean missing? It's the feeling that makes me think sometimes he might be dead. It's something you don't like to admit that he's dead, but maybe that feeling was a premonition. At 9 a.m. on Monday, December 3rd, this is probably about 50 hours after Mike was last seen, the uh, West Palm Beach Police Department issued a bolo, be on the lookout for Mike and his car, and also entered uh, the young man and his car's information into the FCIC, which is a Florida database. On December 4th, Sergeant Engelhart contacted the county jail to see if Mike had been incarcerated or locked up for some reason. Maybe he was there, he wasn't. When talking to Jim Cronin, he told him that the last time he'd seen him was at 5 a.m., and that he had told him when he was dropping him off that uh, he may be a little late for work, maybe around 7 a.m. Cronin, in his December 4th interview, told police that on his last date, Mike had gone and met with quality renters. He was still looking for a place to live. And at that point, had also he'd made an obscure reference to a 1,200-mile drive. It was just a one-time comment, and nobody's ever really been able to explain that. December 5th and 6th, the footwork on this really began with the area around Congress and Okeechobee being canvassed uh, during the day, during the evening, and during the early morning hours. On December 7th, 8th, and 9th, Lieutenant Bell of the Palm Beach Sheriff's helicopter section uh, received his first notification, and his pilots were given information regarding the car. Sergeant Walling of the police department then took a photo of Mike and went to Mr. G's. He then went to Denny's restaurant in Okeechobee where Mike had been having breakfast and also the Howard Johnson restaurant. He did that two mornings in a row, showing the photo to people who were eating there if they had recognized Mike and had seen him. He then went and talked to people that he had encountered between 5 a.m. and 6.30 a.m., going uh, along Okeechobee, Congress, to businesses, to people delivering services or products, uh, basically anybody who was out and about during that time of the morning and might have run into Mike. He encountered nothing. On December 9th, the West Palm Beach Police Department called the Edina Police Department and got a call back and was informed that there was no record in that or any of the other jurisdictions uh, about Mike. He had not ever had any contact with local police. The police department then contacted his former employer, the Edina Country Club, and was told that, quote, he was a fine young man and very highly thought of. Sue Olson contacted the police department and part of their communications, just getting information and sharing whatever they knew, and brought up the name Mary Ann McCreary or McCreevy. In the police department report, uh, someone with a pen has gone in and changed the final R to a V or the final V to an R. 
It's difficult to see what it was, but Marianne McCreary or Marianne McCreevy. Sue Olson said that she was either a teacher or a professor at Florida Southern University, and Mike had somehow brought her name up as either being somebody that he was friendly with or that he knew. The police contacted Florida Southern and were, quote, unable to locate any record of this person. This was in hopes of a possible lead that did not materialize. And that was pretty much the last time that we've heard of Marianne McCreary or Marianne McCreevy. We don't know who she was or what her role in Mike's life was. On December 9th, the police also updated the car info, adding that there was a tag for Miller Motor Company of Austin, Minnesota on the rear bumper. This was added to the Bolo and FCIC. Photos were also distributed to the local press, again, keeping Mike's face out there, trying to shake loose some, some leads, some people who may have seen him, or seen him before or after, or knew people who knew something. So getting the photos out were really important. Those went into a local press that started churning out pretty quickly. The Minneapolis paper, on December 9th called Engelhart for an interview. They were gonna get the story out as quickly as they could, try to uh, get the information that Mike was missing to as many of his friends as possible, those who had not already heard about it through the grapevine. Hopefully someone amongst his friends had heard from Mike or heard something of Mike. December 14th, John Olson had called the 10th, 12th, and 13th. He said on the 14th that he would continue to stay in touch and if he heard any news in Minnesota that he'd pass it along. He'd also found that Mike's final paycheck for $65 was at the President's Golf Club and had not been picked up. On December 14th, for the second time, Engelhart asked the West Palm Beach Airport Police Department to go through their parking lot and see if the car was there. Maybe Mike had, had parked it and taken a flight somewhere. They found nothing. Cronin was also interviewed on December 14th, and he was brought back for, I believe, the fourth interview on December 18th. On January 3rd, 1980, Sue Olson, Mike's mother, called the police department at about an $8.22 discrepancy that had been on Mike's bill and had been paid for by Jim Cronin. She was just wondering what the discrepancy was, how this extra $8.22 showed up, and, and what that was about. Engelhart went back over to the Howard Johnsons and found that the room rate had gone up $3.12 for the final night. And uh, there was also a 15-minute $5.10 phone call to a phone number in Edina. He was able to trace the phone number to a friend of Mike's, a student who was a year ahead of him in high school. Apparently, they were friends and uh, stayed in touch. Lieutenant Mitchell with the department said that he would call and talk to the young man if any information was pertinent. He would pass it along to Engelhart to be entered into the record. Nothing was entered into the record, so apparently nothing was relevant to the case, and we don't know what Mike's final phone call with a friend back in the Twin Cities was ever about, what they discussed, what his mood was, what his plans were. January 24th, 1980, it was back to the Howard Johnsons. This time, there's a reference in the police record to a Gloria Rose, another bill skipper. She'd been in room 210, this would have been the floor above Mike Olson. They seemed very interested in the report about what time she had checked in. Again, she had skipped and never paid her bill, but they were interested as to who Gloria Rose was. They determined the time that she had checked in as to be no earlier than 9 a.m. No reference to Gloria Rose or who she was or if she had any relevance to the story has ever come back up. So she was just another lead that they were checking, and it was evidence that they were checking every lead. Also on January 24th, it was referenced that Lieutenant Reem, Sergeant McGinley, and Sergeant Conklin had obtained a boat to search, quote, the water areas around the hotel to no avail. January 25th, Engelhart was back. He was looking at registration for the rooms around Mike on the evening of November 30th, but also the nights before that. In room 112, there was a Harold Gordon of Fairview, Tennessee, and then in room 150, 16, our mystery man, Michael Fafel of Loxahatchee, Florida. Again, <laughs> fake name, but he registered his real car, a BMW. I was able to find the guy and sent him an email asking him about, you know, that date back in 1930. Whatever he was doing at the hotel, he was there under a fake name. So maybe if he saw or heard anything, he just at that point didn't want to bring anything up because it would cause a little trouble for him. The phone number for the address that he used when he registered, the elusive Mr. Faffel, was actually for another motel. A Mrs. Culbertson told the police that he had not been there in a year and that she believed that he was living with his brother on Kirk Road. 
This was the last reference to this individual. So they apparently talked to him, and he claimed to have not heard anything. February 21st, 1980, they expanded the aerial search. That is the notation in the record for that day. June 20th, 1980, the final entry in the investigative file for the disappearance of Michael John Olson, a sheriff from an adjoining jurisdiction, had reached out and requested Mike Olson's dental records because they had found an uh, unknown male body. And that was it. That's the final entry in the case file for Mike Olson, at least that is available to the public. This is a report that was shared with me by a local author who has looked at the case. We don't know what else is in the case file, and according and according to this author, it is still active. Looking at the timeline, they got a 48-hour late start on it, but it also looks like they really didn't miss much. Checking the airports, checking the water, going out at the hours of the day that this incident had occurred, showing the photo around at businesses, the interviews, the follow-up at the hotel. It appears they did a very thorough job and sadly came up with nothing. This is a pond that's directly behind where the hotel was. There's a canal that runs north-south right there, and then there's another canal that runs east-west right there. Like Florida, there's ponds and canals everywhere. When I first stumbled on this, uh, the Charlie Project had said that it led me to a Reddit account where people were theorizing what had occurred, and a lot of people suggested that maybe you ended up in water, and that's sadly something that happens down here where a car will end up in a pond or uh, another body of water and be there for a real long time. It happened in Texas just a few years ago, or actually in Oklahoma, where they were doing, law enforcement was doing an exercise, a training exercise in a lake, and they found two cars, one from 1969 and one from 1970. Each had three bodies. These were people who had just disappeared off the face of the earth. Well, they'd made a wrong turn and they'd ended up in the water. This is directly behind the hotel. So one thing I thought was maybe coming back instead of turning right into the parking lot, he turned left and bumped across this little area right here and it ended up in the water. <clears throat> the canals are cleaned by South Florida Water Management and that would have been found. The pond doesn't seem like it's big enough to hold a car for a very long time, but the theory that he's in water, like the psychic suggested, isn't too far-fetched. If you fly over Florida, when you fly in and you look out the window of the plane, there's ponds everywhere. So maybe not this pond, but somewhere else. Uh, the police did go out in a boat and check various bodies of water along the route. If he had, for some reason, decided to cut and do straight from the Baptist Church up to here, it, you know, as the, crows fly, as the crow flies, it would have been, you know, shorter, but actually it goes through a maze of back streets. There are a lot of canals and other uh, ponds and uh, little reservoirs and stuff back there that he could have ended up in. But it's, again, it's an eight minute ride. It seems like it would have been kind of dumb. But here is one of the ponds that they looked at and the most logical one directly behind the hotel. Now, referencing water. Uh, that was something, again, that one of the psychics had said that he was in the water. And Florida has a lot of water hazards. I mean, there's water ponds everywhere. So when you do an aerial view of Palm Beach, there are a lot of ponds. There are a lot of canals. And I guess one of the things that has always, you know, just confounded me is that they never found the car. Now, I'm not an expert with chop shops. And there were two full days before anybody was alerted that he was really missing. So, yeah, it could have been chopped up. But... What about water? Let's say, for instance, that he leaves Belvedere Baptist Church. Leaving the church, you pull onto Cherry Street and immediately turn onto Congress and head north. Let's say he didn't. Let's say he crossed Congress. That then puts him back in a really confusing maze of residential streets. And it's five in the morning. He has been drinking. Uh, he's been up all night. Once you get back there and you don't have GPS, it's really difficult. And there is some water. You have a canal. The only way to get across the canal and up towards where his, his goal was is to get all the way through the, the housing development, the residential area, to a street called North Florida Mango Road. That will take you up across the canal and get you to the Hojos. 
But even to get there, it's again, you're winding through a lot of streets. It's really confusing, and there is some water. The other possibility, if you follow this theory, and he's crossed Congress and he's now back there, is that he encountered some trouble. That was something that the police referenced in you know, their reports, that maybe he you know, ran afoul of somebody. It's Florida in 1979. There was a lot of drugs coming in. It's 5 a.m. on Saturday morning. Maybe some people are back there at one of their homes unloading some bales or other contraband that they've just retrieved from a boat in a canal or at a beach or something like that, and Mike comes driving along. It's a possibility. We don't have to stick with the theory that he just turned on to Congress, went up, took a ride in Okeechobee, went over to the Hojos, and something happened. Maybe he went back, for lack of a better term, a shortcut, intentional or unintentional, and something happened back there. Here we go. This is the Okeechobee view of El Dorado Furniture in 1979. There would have been a Howard Johnson that was sitting there. When the police had exhausted their efforts, uh, the family turned it over to a private investigator here in the Palm Beach area called Jack Harwood, and he picked up where the police left off and began interviewing or trying to reach out to everybody who had been staying at the hotel. Maybe perhaps they had heard something. The people or the people or guests in room 112, which were on one side of Mike, were a family from Tennessee who I believe they were able to get in touch with and obviously didn't have anything pertinent. The guy in room 116 was registered under Mr. Faffle. Well, that was a fake name, but and this is obviously a lesson to future adulterers. Don't put your real license plate number for your BMW on your registration then. So uh, Harwood was able to get in touch with him and I guess was not able to provide anything useful. I did find this individual. He still lives here. He got married in 1985 and I just basically emailed and asked if he remembered anything from that one night. <laughs> in uh, 1979. He didn't reply. I was very disappointed. The people above Mike's room uh, replied from Arizona to their letter, and they had heard something. They had heard a scuffle, but had chosen not to get involved. Jack Harwood, in an interview with one of the local papers a few years later, and he did put up some billboards, uh, talked about the case, and his quote was that the kid's dead. That was his opinion. And he had also begun to get a lot of other cases piled on him, and he didn't want to soak the Olsons for too much money. He had pretty much reached the end of his, his limit with the case. He did believe, and he said this in the interview, that a serial killer named Christopher Wilder was the, the person who did it. Christopher Wilder was known as the Beauty Queen Killer. There's a book about him. He was killed by the police in 1984 but not until or after he had uh, committed a number of homicides around the U.S., including in the Florida area, where he would target women in shopping mall parking lots, murder them, and then throw them into canals, which in Florida is, uh, that's pretty much it in terms of ever recovering the body. He believes that Mike, or he believed that Mike may have crossed paths at one of the nightclubs. Maybe he was dancing with somebody that Christopher Wilder was targeting for that night and upset him. But for whatever reason, even though Mike Olson was not in the uh, kind of demo or stereotype of, of people that Christopher Wilder was targeting, Jack Harwood believed that he was the person involved. The Olsons, as the police began their search and investigation, continued on at home as best they could. In an interview shortly after Mike's disappearance, his mother Sue stated that she believed he had amnesia and it would, you know, return soon. Uh, his father, John, seemed a little bit more resigned. You could tell that very early on. In, in an interview in 1981, he was talking about the first time they went down to Florida shortly after the disappearance to help look for uh, Mike and that there were seven murders that week. And the second time they went down, there were five murders in a week. They continued to make uh, car insurance payments for Mike's car just in hopes that uh, it, it would keep him on the road or help get the car found. That didn't happen. They sent his class ring and fraternity pin and photos and favorite clothes to some of the clairvoyants. In the 1981 interview, John Olson said, the police and psychics think he's in a canal. In terms of the car, police told him that uh, theft rings could dismantle a car in just hours. When the police, when the police had reached, you know, the end of their investigation and what they could do with it as an active case, the Olsons hired private investigator Jack Harwood, who was pretty famous in South Florida, the West Palm Beach area. 
very well known. Uh, he started with scratch, uh, with notes and notations and all the records. He also, over the course of a couple of years, put up a billboard or a couple of billboards to draw attention and hopefully some, some tips. In a 1984 interview called The Rich and Infamous in a West Palm Beach newspaper, uh, Harwood talked about the case. He said, a kid like that just doesn't disappear. I've checked everything. He wasn't in drugs, nor did he owe money or have a girl who might have caused problems. The only thing I can think of is that maybe somebody saw he had a little money and a new Grand Prix and killed him for it. But even then, he wouldn't just vanish from the face of the earth. Somebody would know something or have something or his car would show up. Other cases came along and Harwood couldn't afford to keep up the pace of an investigation that led nowhere. His hunch was that somebody had jumped Olson in the parking lot of the motel, but none of the guests had reported hearing a disturbance. One of the things that he did, and I already stated, was that he reached out to everybody who was registered, and there were a lot of people who had stayed there under fake names. One of the people that the police were talking about in their investigation was Gloria Rose, an anonymous person who skipped out on her room. The room rate for the Howard Johnsons in Okeechobee in November of 1979 was $27 a night. Returning to the newspaper article, Looking over the list of phony addresses, many people do not give true addresses at hotels. He noted that one of them was in Loxahatchee. What struck me was that Loxahatchee was spelled right, says Harwood. Not too many people know how to spell Loxahatchee, and I figured that it had to be somebody from out around there. Harwood began hanging around Loxahatchee, but turned up nothing. And then came Christopher Wilder. There is a chance he might be the guy, says Harwood. He liked to hang around those bars where there was a lot of action. Maybe he saw this kid pick up a girl and liked the girl and killed the kid to meet the girl. Wilder also seemed to have a special talent for making his victims disappear. There had been no trace of two beautiful young women, 20-year-old Rosario Gonzalez of Miami and Elizabeth Kenyon, 23, a teacher at Coral Gables High School, he had been suspected of killing just before he fled Florida. Harwood said, if he dumped the body out in some canal, you'll never find it. The danger with Wilder is that everybody will be trying to clear their file with him, but this is one case that really gets to me. Family's money ran out long ago, but I'll never stop working on it. We're coming up on the 42nd anniversary of the disappearance of Mike Olson, and even if we were able to find Marianne McCreevy or Marianne McCreary or a housekeeper at the hotel or the adultery guy, Mr. Faffel. Memories over 42 years. I look back at, you know, my freshman year in college. If you ask me to remember something from November of 1979, a specific incident, walking back to a dorm or driving on Pacific Coast Highway or something like that, it would just be at best a Polaroid photo. So what we're working with in, you know, something this old are newspaper articles, interviews with John Olson, who is the spokesperson for the family during this tragedy and the police report. Going through all of this, there were two disparities that kind of have jumped out at me. And uh, I'm gonna wrap up with you know a mystery on a mystery. John Olson, in an interview, was talking about Mike's night out and referred to Mike and the boys. The only person who was interviewed was Jim Cronin. So were there other people that were out there, you know, socializing with them that night and were not interviewed? They weren't in the police report. The second thing that's really difficult to resolve is the time frame. In the police report, it's referred to as 5 a.m. is when he dropped off uh, his co-worker at the van at Belvedere Baptist Church. John Olson and other people in interviews or on sites like the Charlie Project say that it's 4.30. The police report says 5, and they use 5 a.m. as the starting point for going out and interviewing people in the neighborhood. So I'm going to go with 5 a.m. John Olson, in an interview, said that uh, after going to the Wild Side, Mike and the boys went out to a couple of more bars. The only bar that we know that they went to uh, was Mr. G's, and the closing time for that was 4 a.m. If you have a drop-off time of even 4.30 a.m., you still have half an hour that's unaccounted for, and Mr. G's was only a five, six, maybe minute drive away from where the parking lot was that he dropped off his coworker. So 4.30, 5 a.m., that's a half hour to an hour that's unaccounted for. And when you're looking at somebody who has a lot of cash on him and a new car, that's a lot of time for him to show up as a target on somebody's radar. 
somebody who is going to take advantage of that at 5 a.m. in the morning when it's dark and the streets are deserted. On one of the Reddit threads, there was a reference to a bar that was over near the track and the church that they may have gone to. That's possible, but if so, the police still did not go out there with photos and interview people. Jim Cronin did not tell them about that bar, so I'm going to say that they probably didn't. But then you still, again, have 30 to 60 minutes after Mr. G's closed that are unaccounted for, and that's just kind of a mystery. So I'm going to wrap this up at the halfway point, literally, between the Baptist Church, which is back there, and then the Howard Johnson's, which is up there and to the right. If you see this video, watch this video, which you obviously are, and you have a thought or an observation or a suggestion, post it in the comments. If you actually know something about it, you should call the West Palm Beach Police Department at 561-822-1900. Uh, in the course of looking at this and looking at the police report and the newspaper articles and the interviews, there are a couple of, uh, not discrepancies, but... For instance, the President's Golf Club is referred to as the Presidential Golf Club. Uh, I think because it was on Presidential Way, that's neither here nor there. And obviously, uh, the, the time that he was dropped off. In the police report, it says 5 a.m. In some of the articles and interviews, it says uh, 4.30. The private detective that they hired said 4.30. Either way, it was very early in the morning. It was right back there. Uh, I drove around looking to see if there was a place to put a billboard. That was one of the things when I first discovered this. You know, I was doing research for a podcast, and uh, the husband of, of my client is actually in law enforcement in North Carolina. And he'd ask if the people from my school had thought about putting up a billboard, because he said, you know, sometimes that's good. It will uh, call attention to the case, maybe get the police to look back at it. He said sometimes, and only in movies, Will the criminal drive by and get a case of the guilts? He said that <clears throat> sometimes, you know, late in life people want to clear the record, but he said, you know, sometimes they get religion. But he said if they get religion, and this was his term, they, they feel that they've already been uh, redeemed or saved and they shouldn't have to go to jail for something that they did so long ago. He said also people sometimes will drive by and just look at it and go, oh, wait, you know, it triggered a memory of somebody they had had breakfast with or something like that. So that is it. Thank you for watching the video, and hopefully someday we can bring Mike home.